everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Launchpad. I'm Ali Swain, and I am joined today by Michael and Kyle Triwartha, also known as the musical duo Gray. Hey, guys, how are you doing today? Uh, so good. How are you? So glad to have you here on The Launchpad. I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. So I know you guys just went on a trip to Japan to celebrate Michael's birthday. Happy belated birthday. Super glad to have you here after. How was your trip? What did you guys do that was fun there? It was so fun. I mean, it was my first time in Japan. It was our first time in Japan for Halloween, which was really special. Um, just everybody dressing up as anime characters is always my favorite thing. But uh, one of the shows that we played was like Halloween weekend at oh, this great. new place called Miyakita Park. And it was so fun because everybody was dressed up and it was just kind of crazy vibes. And we made a bunch of edits with like, anime intro songs in our set and yeah we also made um a bohemian rhapsody like edit that has it's sync that like it's being sung in japanese the lyrics are all japanese <laughs> yeah. which is so fun that is so cool yeah, yeah people were tripping up yeah we like randomly found online a cover this japanese guy did a cover like back in the day and we just like ripped it with like an ai software yeah. and then put it over it and it like worked perfectly yeah that honestly seems like it would get the crowd going, especially in the language translation, too. That would be so sick yeah. to see. So it sounds yeah. like you guys have performed at quite some interesting venues, a lot of cool places across the world. Where have your favorite travels and your favorite performances been thus far? Um, I think my favorite performance was when we were on tour with Zed. We played at this huge arena um, in Japan. That was like probably my favorite one. Yeah. But um, we've been to a bunch of places. I know we've been to Sweden to work on music. He loves Sweden. Yeah. What do you love about really Sweden, crazy. Kyle? <laughs> um, I like a good conversation. And it felt like if I just stopped a random person on the street and started talking to them, everyone's interesting. Like, yeah. A lot of cool stories know, just, to hear. Yeah, cool stories and, and interesting perspectives. And, and people just have like, their vibe is so open and they're not like, like in LA, people are just like, I don't want to talk to you, but they're just so welcoming and like, yeah, they just want to like talk and yeah. Yeah. And just like some of the most talented songwriters in the world, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Who are some of your inspirations that are out there? Uh, so. There's this guy named Oscar Gores. Yeah. Oscar Gores. He does all of Troy Sivan stuff. Okay, great. Um, he's, yeah, he is incredible. Um, there's like two, I, I, we always say her name wrong. Is it Tuve Stierke? Yeah, Tuve Stierke. Yeah, I don't know. There's just a, there's this girl, Scott, that we worked with on our first EP. She's insane as She's well. She's insane. Uh, yeah, I don't know. There's just so many amazing songwriters. and There's Leon. Yeah, Leon as well. <laughs> we have a song with her as well. We We just tend to like work with a lot of Swedish people, I guess. We have a song with Oscar as well, so. Hey, that's the way yeah. to go. A lot of great people out there. Glad that you guys could connect. So I know you guys have done a couple new releases recently. What have you guys been feeling coming off of kind of the transition from being on the production side to now being vocalists on your own tracks? How has that kind of empowered your music and helped you kind of have more of a creative edge, if you will, and be more in your creative process throughout those EPs? Yeah, I mean, we... Back when we were doing a lot of like electronic music stuff, um, we weren't really singing on our own music. Mm -hmm. And then after Starving in the Middle and stuff came out and we started focusing on some more pop-centric stuff, we both started singing a, a bit more. And we put out a couple of EPs that had us singing on it as well, which helped. And we were just practicing a lot. And during that time, we got a lot better at songwriting. So it's really fun to go back to making electronic music now that we have like the songwriting capabilities and able the ability to like sing on our own stuff because it gives us a lot more power and doing it in the way we want to do and it kind of makes the whole song come to a spot that it wouldn't have beforehand you know so Absolutely. yeah i think like the new songs on the ep the new ep are just like well, way more like better packaged as a whole because it's like we did the songwriting from the beginning we sing on them and we can just make it exactly how we want you know it's interesting how every piece affects other, every other piece where like 
being a better producer makes you better at songwriting and vice versa. So just the more that you can have your hands in every piece of it, the better. If you're just taking a vocal off of Splice and trying to work from there, it's it's limiting, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that's the position that a lot of people are in. Um, but yeah. I feel like it would be a lot of fun to be able to be on all sides of the production element from vocals to production. You really do get to be able to put out whatever you want to be able to create. So I find that really exciting yeah. for you guys. So yeah. speaking of exactly. your new EPs, I know Contra was your newest release. Can you guys speak a little bit on that? What inspired this EP? Um, we've been like really inspired by like worldly samples and stuff that feels like from all corners of the world. And there's been a lot of cool stuff on Splice that was kind of ethnic in a cool way. And I think one of the songs, IDK, you started with like a really cool vocal sample. And I kind of like set the tone for the EP because everything kind of just feels like it's yeah. some like grand adventure or something. I don't know. Sound design wise, like we like we said, we we started out making very electronic heavy music. And then there were many years where we focused more on how do we get good at songwriting and the best place to learn that is pop music for sure. Um, but now we've kind of, we're trying to kind of combine both, both worlds, I guess, where this it's definitely in the EDM lane, but it's a lot more top line focused and vocal focused than a lot of EDM songs. So, and yeah. through this transition between bridging those two gaps, What have you learned along the way? What have you learned about that production songwriting element that you didn't know before? I guess you started this side of the venture because you guys have been in this realm for quite some time, I believe. I feel like one kind of big takeaway through doing a lot of the songwriting stuff is like trying to be more simple with things and like simplify a lot. Yeah. Because we, if you just, if we're just left to our own devices, we kind of just overcomplicate just no matter what, we're just going to add more, add more, add more. And so it just sounds like the most insane, yeah. complex, messy thing. Um, I think it, this kind of comes down to ego in a sense, because I think everyone wants to feel like they did something and that they added something. Like, let's say you had a song that was almost like basically done and then you gave it to someone else to collab with. They would probably just like add more, add way more than needed to be there just because they wanted to feel like they were a part of it, you know? Right. Um, and in the same way, when you're not the one writing uh, the vocal and you're only producing, it will make you think, let's just make this the craziest production we've ever heard. But maybe the vocal doesn't need that. Mm-hmm. So right. when you're the one writing the vocal, it lets you be objective about what does this song actually need instead of like, how do I feel? Uh, like I added something. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's that makes perfect sense. Kind of taking away that little bit of ego that everyone has going into things, being able to, how you're saying, simplify it down and realize what does that musically need as opposed to just adding more and layering on top. It's like what actually is needed to make this a yeah. great song or a great production that we can do. So totally makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So I know you guys have worked on a lot of collaborations from the middle to starving. What makes for a really good collaboration in your eyes? And how does that work in a fluid relationship? Hmm. It's funny you say relationship because when you say that, the first thought that comes to my mind is, is relationships. Like what makes a good marriage? It's not when two people are opposites. If two people are truly opposite on everything, they're going to hate each other. But it's also not them being the exact same because that's boring. It's like you want to be really similar on the things that really matter, the core core of you, but then have differences where it's like you could be me in another life. That's that's what a good collaborator feels like. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like I think one of our first actual collaborations we did was with our friend Steven. And we didn't even know him as well as we do now, obviously, back then. And it was kind of like a he was like a new friend. But when we got back because we were just sending music back and forth after we wrote it in Joshua Tree. But when we got back his first um, edit of it, it was, we were like listening to it and we were both just like, what the fuck? This is crazy. Like, it, it was like exactly what, like you said, like in another life, if we were to do music and we were brought up a different way, it, that's exactly how it would sound. And it just felt like perfect. There, there's, 
as as you're working on something, you're slowly becoming um, accustomed to it, and it, and you get numb to what you're even doing. So you never get to fully enjoy hearing your song for the first time because you're always hearing a little bit of it as you're making it. But I imagine a good collaborator is someone who it it feels like you took a sleeping pill and made a song and you woke up and heard it for the first time, you know, that that's what like my favorite people that we work with. It feels like, you know, absolutely. You get that yeah. excitement each time you hear that track. That's how excited you are to work. Yeah. Together. And that's always a beautiful yeah. thing too, especially when you have a great relationship and then going forward. Now you have a great product that you've produced. It makes having it out there even more exciting. So you guys have been around in the music industry for quite some time. How did it feel coming into the music industry and how did you kind of get your foot in the door to be able to be where you are today? Um, I started making electronic music in 2010. Um, and I had a project called Singularity and it was just a grind. I was just so poor and just try, trying to make anything work and you know i quit college um and i went on this big tour actually my first big tour and then my manager stole all my money like from the tour and no it way so it just yeah so it, it really felt like it wasn't gonna work out you know but over time i just started meeting more people and then in 2015 michael and i decided to start a project together at gray and we got lucky enough that um, Skrillex responded to one of our emails that we sent him. And yeah, so I think it's, they say like preparation meets opportunity. That's definitely what it was for us. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like the question that you said about coming, like how does it feel coming into the music industry? Like I didn't, I don't remember like a exact moment when I felt like, oh, I'm in the music industry or something. But um yeah, there's definitely things that for a while we were just like, yeah, everything's fine. Why do people say the music industry is so like toxic and bad and scary? But then like after a while, there's definitely things that happen that you're just like, oh, okay, this is why this is why people say this. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's kind of a jungle. <laughs> Absolutely. And what would you say and what type of advice would you give to new artists that are coming into this industry and maybe don't know what to do or contemplating maybe just being like, how is this going to work out? What am I going to do? How am I going to move forward? It's funny. Like we, to that same question, we used to always say like, Oh, just spend a lot of time getting really good at songwriting and spend time getting good at producing and maybe singing or learning an instrument or whatever it is. And that's still really important, of course. But um, nowadays I just feel like it's really important to be, just as focused on that on sorry just focused on like tiktok and instagram and marketing yourself as it is being actually good at music yeah um yeah it's just you just have to like sell yourself a lot nowadays and whether that's through like your songwriting whether it's through like doing just talking to your fans through social media just you, you just have to be really balanced in that sense yeah nowadays for it sure. sucks answering that way because it's it's not the answer you want to hear and it's not like what you would see in a movie yeah. where like the, the guy just or the girl the just spends all their yeah. life grinding and it works out. Yeah. But to be honest, it's almost like you said, just as much about TikTok and Instagram and everything. Right. Marketing yourself, showing the world that you are yeah. confident is yourself. Completely. Yeah. Exactly. And it's like a double-edged sword too, because even when you're super skilled in music, if you don't market yourself, it's kind of hard to get that kind of running start yep. towards the music industry. Some of our Definitely. some of our favorite producers and songwriters and people that we've met through the years are just so 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 talented, but they just are not good at the social media side like us. We're not good at it either. Yeah, and it's, it's hard. It's like sucks to see like such good talent go unnoticed. Mm. Right. And social media, I feel like, yeah. is a lot harder than it seems, especially when it comes to marketing yourself yeah. and marketing music. I feel like it comes down yeah. to a lot of analytics and a lot of making yeah. sure you're paying attention to those trends. 
It's a full-time job. Yeah. People will be like, yeah, you got to post like twice a day. I'm like, okay, so I'm spending all day every day doing this? or Because well, you're yeah, right. posting twice a day on seven different platforms. Yeah. It's like, oh, man. Yeah. And not only have to attend enough things in order to have enough pictures to get that onto the social media, too. Yeah. And also so make all like, the music and the artwork. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When you guys yeah. think about your role, what is the oddest thing i guess that comes into your day-to-day that you wouldn't have expected going into the music industry or becoming musicians i feel like liners are super odd and weird even though that's a normal thing like recording liners for like some radio station in a different country like and having to speak spanish in like doing like a liner in spanish and then doing like a whole day where you're just recording liners all day just like Hey, this is this, da, 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 da. And like, I don't know, that's like a normal one though, but I'm trying to think of like more odd stuff. Mm. I mean, we do some really weird stuff with some, we have a lot of stuff going on, but yeah, I'm not sure. I try to think of anything. Um, I mean, we've just gone down the rabbit hole with the video side of things. And there's just so like video goes even deeper than audio. And uh, yeah, so I don't know. There's just a lot of weird things to do with video that i don't think you you would think that if you're a musician you just make music but that's just not true anymore yeah yeah right and i was going through (laughs) your guys's youtube the other day and speaking of your videos i was going through the music videos that is quite a high production element that you guys put into those so very interesting and what kind of what is the process of creating a music video Because it's not just creating the song and then having this video playing in front of it. I feel like it's a lot of prep work. So what, how does that go in your eyes? I mean, it starts with like a storyboard, which people, I don't know if people like know how that works, but you just have to like write out scene for scene, shot like shot lists and storyboard out the whole thing. Um, And then... Yeah, finding a director that's down to do it for not a million dollars. <laughs> and then, yeah, there's just, I mean, there's a lot of planning. It's yeah. kind of crazy. And even when it's all filmed, you make the thing in, in the edit. You know, it's the same with music, too. And then you got to color correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then nowadays, make 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 it into a... Uh, What's it called vertical. format? Vertical <laughs> format. Yeah. Take the whole music video, make it vertical, or put, take the whole music video, put it on YouTube, it gets ten thousand plays. Make it vertical, put it on TikTok, it gets five million. <laughs> and there's no reason to make the whole video in the first place. <laughs> yeah, I, I read some article that people are taking the the money and the budget of the record label or whatever, and just making little TikTok videos instead of making music videos. It just makes more sense now. It's crazy how TikTok has become this like insane, almost like an advertisement platform, but this multimedia platform in some sense and how it really is almost transitioning the music industry. How has social media kind of changed your guys' perspective on the music industry and what goes into the, I guess, behind the scenes of music? I mean, I... We'd be lying if we said it didn't put a little bit of like a sour taste in our mouth when you see like like dancers that have never sung or done any music in their life just throw, like put out a song and just because they're famous that they just become instant successes. It's kind of frustrating, but it's also like whatever. If we were that age, of course, we'd probably be doing the same thing. Like if we had like if I had TikTok when I was twelve. Like, that's all we were doing back then is recording random, like, funny videos and going outside and doing pranks and whatever. And that that would be so sick to be able to put it, like, use your phone to record it and then put it on a a website that gets millions and millions of views. Yeah, of course, it would be the same thing. I think the current state of the algorithm is a bit sad because it incentivizes people to just go towards the least common denominator thing. So it's like, if if people generally have small attention spans, then you have to make your song just start with the hypest part. And it like very much shapes what people do, not towards what's beautiful or transcendent, but towards like what the dumbest thing is that you can, that you can do basically. That's, That's a harsh way to put it, but that's how I see it. But I think 
over time, I hope these algorithms evolve to be more niche focused so that it will recognize what each person's person's niche is Mm -hmm. and serve them exactly the weird thing that they like. Um, And in that way, the algorithm could help everyone. But I don't think we're quite there yet. Yeah, like an easy example is just, I bet if you pulled up a like a list of every song ever and just looked and that there was like a graph of the length of the song, the length of the songs just been going shorter and shorter. Like yeah. literally there used to be five, six minute long songs, like Michael Jackson songs, like yeah. Queen songs. And now everything is two minutes to one minute and 30 seconds. Like it's crazy. People just can't pay attention to a song for longer than two yeah. minutes. But I hope these things go through cycles. Like I was saying, and I hope music gets weirder soon. Um, Absolutely. And I do feel how you're saying how music has kind of, I guess, shortened over the years and the attention span to music has kind of shortened as well. It's a really interesting turn. And I hope it does go in phases where it'll kind of circle back. So as I know, and I'm sure everyone else knows, you guys are brothers that get to work together. How is that dynamic? And how has that been great for you guys in a working relationship? It's pretty easy. We're pretty used to it i feel like whenever people ask us this question <laughs> i i'm just like i don't know i just don't see it as weird or I, maybe i'm just like so used to it no it's because they want they want the tea they want the drama they want to be like Ooh, we bicker and we fight and oh but i'm better at this and you're better at that oh it's like we're like mature enough to know our, our strengths and we also since we grew up together listening to the exact types of music and just being surrounded by all that and being in drum line together and all that stuff. We just have the exact same taste. So we know we can fully trust each other musically. Yeah. So it's just a lot easier in that sense. Absolutely. I feel like working as siblings together, it really adds this element of trust to a working dynamic yeah. where I guess you wouldn't get with other people that you'd work with. So that's why I was more so interested because I feel like that would that's add you. to a working dynamic a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I maybe because I got so used to it, it's it's made it so that the only people that we collab with, I do feel like are basically our brothers. Like we, that's the bar is it needs to feel like a, a sibling. You have to be our sibling to collab. Well, yeah, <laughs> just like you need to feel like our sibling, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. And that ties all the yeah, way back we, to that relational element of it. Yeah, for sure. And we get to share a credit card for the LLC. I can just <laughs> use half of his money whenever I want. There you go. Hidden perks everywhere. What can you say? Yeah. <laughs> and then I know we had talked a little bit earlier about your guys' travels. Is there any place that's still on your guys' bucket list to go thus far? Yeah. Um. Yeah, definitely. I mean, where haven't we been? I haven't been to Brazil yet. Yeah, I've never, never Brazil. I've never been to South America. I've been to Central America, but never South. I would love to go to Africa. Yeah. Yeah. What would you like to see in Africa the most? Um, I mean, maybe it's like the cheesy answer, but just like the savanna, you know. And I don't know. I want to go to a place that has like crazy big waterfalls. I know they have big waterfalls in Africa. That would be sick. Absolutely. Just like anywhere that has some crazy music culture, that'd be super fun. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. And Kyle, I know, are you more of an outdoorsy guy? Is that why the waterfalls are the more attractive side of a vacation to you? It's funny because we spend so much time inside because of our job. But when we do go outside to like go on some adventure we're probably more adventurous than a lot of people who spend more time outside than us if that makes sense we're just kind of extreme we're like we're we're inside and then when we go outside we go like cliff jumping off a dam so see that's the best way to do it michael i saw you were really good at skating where did that come about uh roller skating or skateboarding well both Oh yeah. <laughs> uh I mean I just I roller skated like every weekend for I don't know 7 years growing up. It was just like 
the thing to do in Fountain Valley where we grew up. And then I have same with skateboarding, like 10 years of my life, I was just skateboarding every day and biking. And I don't know, I was just the, the usual kid that just does every action sport. <laughs> but Absolutely. yeah, I don't know. I just love that stuff. See, and that's always fun. You got to have that balance where you get the indoor side and the outdoor side, being able to get out there. <laughs> yeah. So I know we're transitioning into 2024. What are you guys looking forward? What's kind of on the horizon for you guys? Anything exciting for us to look out for? I mean, we're putting out our EP, the like the last couple songs in February. And yeah, we're just going to start focusing on making some more awesome music we have we yeah we have some collabs lined up yeah we're gonna be working with some people that we're really excited about yeah it's gonna be fun and uh we may or may not have a song in a popular netflix show oh <laughs> forgot about that <laughs> Ooh, yeah. well i can't wait to hear more on that that's yeah. really exciting that seems like you guys have a lot of fun things coming up in 2024 so with your guys' EP, Raven and uh, 70S, what was the inspiration behind these two songs? And how has your production element and sort of your sound changed along with these? Um, for 70S, um, we wrote it with a girl named Aurora the Serpent. Yeah. A while, like, I don't know, like maybe a year and a half, two years ago. Yeah. And I think she just had the idea of like doing um, a song... It's like the modern about, deadly seven deadly sins. Yeah, like the modern seven deadly sins. Yeah. So in the in the build, which is kind of like the chorus kind of, it kind of just uh it lists out the seven deadly sins but in a in a modern way. That was fun. And then we showed it to our friend away, our friend Dan. He's like one of our best friends and he really liked it and he was like, I'm super down to do this with you guys. And that just came out really natural. Yeah. Um. And then Raven. Yeah, we wrote Raven with our friends Sayak and Coco. Yeah. And, and yeah, that one. What? How did I come to the? I don't know. I think I was just like fresh off watching like a episode of One Piece or something, which is like a pirate anime, and I was thinking that I've never, I've never like written a song about pirates. Yeah. And I was kind of like inspired by that and it kind of became like some game of thrones pirate mix thing and yeah i don't know it just started with the, with the lyric raven it's cool how much like a chord progression or a guitar part or something can make you feel a certain way which mm -hmm. will like influence the with the direction of the vocal because yeah yeah we added like like a uh, sounds of a pirate ship creaking like at the beginning of it and stuff yeah it's fun that sounds like a really fun way to come about a song, let me tell you. And is there any yeah. project that you guys have worked on thus far that you guys have been super passionate about? Of course, you're passionate about every project, but is there any one that has kind of stood out to you the most or has been like the most fun to work on? Um, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if it's the most fun, but I feel like I need to call this one out because I feel like no one's heard it. And it's one of my favorite songs we've ever made, but... We got the opportunity to make a song for the official soundtrack for the Blade Runner anime. Yeah. It was on Crunchyroll. And we got hit up to do it. And they were like, yeah, we'd love to get to do it, but it's due in 72 hours. And we're like, what? So we like spent the first, or sorry, it was due in two, two days. Yeah. Yeah, in 48 hours. And they're like, we spent the whole first day on like actually using the 70S vocal and trying to make a song around it and then we did it and then we sent it to them they're like oh no, no no you can't use a pre-existing vocal you have to write it fresh because of like <laughs> no you way. know like stuff with the um label or whatever yeah so then we had 24 hours to write a whole song produce the whole thing get it mixed mastered and we were like all right we could do this and then we just spent all day and finished the whole song start to finish in a day and it and it's like one of my favorite songs we've ever made yeah turned out really cool Called after you. <clears throat> yeah. A 48 hour turnaround for a from start to yeah. finish song. That is wildly yeah. impressive. So round of applause for that because wow. <laughs> and what kind of gateway yeah. do you guys into working on that? 
was it more so a love of anime or more so just you were excited about an opportunity prepared happened to be there i think it's like a mix of books like since i i'm really into anime our managers knew that and they heard about the opportunity and then they brought it to us and we're like, like oh hell yeah for sure and then we had <laughs> no time at all but we made it work sometimes those are the best circumstances to make music yeah well, guys, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. I really appreciated getting to talk to you, and I really loved hearing your guys' answers to some of these questions. I wish you guys nothing but the best in 2024, and I can't wait to hear about your ventures. Thank you guys for watching. This was another episode of The Launchpad. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.